you're here, welcome. My name is Stacy, and I've been living full-time in a cabin in the Yukon wilderness for over 20 years. And I wanna share some of the tips and tricks I've learned throughout the years. And you'll find that I can never do a video without my dogs bumping into my tripod. <laughs> I started my YouTube channel over a year ago to share some of the stuff I've learned while living in a cabin in the woods. I wanted to inspire other people to do the same if it's their dream. It had been my dream for a long time since I was a little kid and watched Grizzly Adams in the 1970s. It was my dream to go and live in a cabin in the woods with Grizzly Adams. That never happened. I did end up in a cabin in the woods eventually. And I really can thank Grizzly Adams for that. You might be asking yourself, Stacy, what the heck is cabin life? Well, let me tell you. I think it might have different definitions for different people, but for me, it's living rurally, it's living simply, kind of remotely, out in the boonies, not a lot of neighbors or any neighbors. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're on grid or off grid, really. I mean, you can have the same type of lifestyle, whether you're on the grid or off the grid. To me, it's also a place where you live kind of surrounded by nature. You can walk outside your door and walk into nature, be surrounded by wildlife and uh, have experiences that you just don't have in a city. Living this way is super common here in the Yukon. Lots of people in cabins, lots of people off grid, dry cabins, cabins with running water, cabins with nothing, small cabins, big cabins, little shacks that they call cabins and rent for $700. <laughs> And it's a huge variety. And so in here in the north, it's pretty common to live in a cabin, find land and live in a cabin. So for me, I find there's less stress living out here as opposed to living in the city with all the lights and traffic and noise. Um, a lot of us are working from home now. So you really gotta love where you live if you're gonna be there all the time working and living. You're just naturally outside more. There's always more, there's always stuff to do when you live rurally like this. And that is just plain good for your health. I lived off grid for about four to five years and uh, I don't now because I lived off grid for over four to five years. <laughs> I'll get into that a little bit later. The cabin I have is one that I designed. I've been here for about 14 years. I designed it very loosely. You can find more on my design process in a video I'll link down below. A friend built a shell in my cabin. He was starting a log cabin building business and built the shell. He put on the roof. He did the inside. He did the stairs. He did the floor joists. The uh, loft joist and that was pretty much it nothing else and uh then said here you go it's all yours now and i gleefully ran from my outdoor tent in november because i was living in a wall tent i was so excited to have a roof over my head and uh, then realized how much work it was going to be and it's still ongoing i still haven't finished but uh you know it's been a comfortable place to live in for quite a few years a steep learning curve back then um, but now you know there's so many resources like YouTube alone is a gold mine in finding uh, off-grid building techniques um, you know step-by-step -step cabin building processes which I won't get into because I don't know enough about that there's way better qualified people uh, with those kind of videos but I'm just here as your moral support I want to give you a few tips I want to help you do it and I want to let you know that you can do it. You can do anything you set your mind to. You can get out there, you can build a cabin, you can find land. It's gonna be work, it's gonna be a lot of work. Right? It, you weren't around then, but it was a lot of work. Ah! Do it. I have full faith in you. It's gonna suck it sometimes, but life is full of sucky moments and you just have to get through them. I've dealt with solar battery systems. I fought with them. I didn't want to learn about them. It was just something that uh, wasn't really for me. There was so much to have to learn when you're building your own place. You have so much energy that you need to put into other things that I just thought, I don't want to learn about solar systems. I just don't want to. And I wanted to have reliable power. You know, it gets really cold here in the winter. And I didn't want to have troubles with vehicles, getting vehicles to get going. I didn't want to get up at four in the morning to start charging my vehicle and worry about how to get to work or to town. But, you know, for me, it was just something I didn't want to deal with. And I knew that pretty quickly after living off grid for a few years, it just wasn't for me. I was a full on city kid who never lived in the bush. Like we went out camping lots. We did, you know, we had a family farm that we went to and spent a lot of time at, but uh, you know, I was in the suburbs and I didn't know anything about building or electrical systems or wiring or anything like that. It's just something I didn't have to think about. So uh, when I moved out here, I just, you know, you just start learning and you just start absorbing everything you can. It's a lot of work, but it's also going to be invaluable because down the road, you'll, you know, have to tap into those skills that you learned 10 years ago 
you know something goes wonky with your wiring and you'll be like hey i took an electrical course 10 years ago i kind of remember how to wire things together so maybe i can fix it myself and also if you're far away from a town and you know it costs a lot to get a professional out to your place like for me it's like an hour drive for them just to come one way um it's not worth it i mean it costs a lot if you need to have something repaired so like my water pump died one day and uh it took me, I was gonna call somebody, or I did call somebody, but he couldn't come for like a month. And I'm like, I can't go without water for a month. So I sucked it up and contacted my buddy in Alaska who helped me set up the system. And um, he helped walk me through it. Like I had to, I knew nothing about plumbing. I had to get together in the plumbing store and put you know everything on the floor and try to make sure that it all fit together with the new pump that I had, because of course it was way different than the old pump. So it was a whole new system and um, wow, like after that horrible week where I wanted to throw the pump out the window a few times, um, it worked out and I ended up fixing it myself. And now if anything goes wrong with my water pump, I know I can put a new one in. If it leaks, I know I can take it apart and fix it or get a new part for it or, you know, troubleshoot basically. So these skills you learn along the way, you may not think of as you're starting, but uh, they'll come in handy down the road. I guarantee it. Okay, that last spot was horrible. I hope you appreciated the suffering I did getting eaten by deer flies. It's not so bad over here. This is my quad shelter. For those of you who have been around, this is a pretty nice little shelter. I should build something bigger so I can hang out in there in the summer. But there's always lots to do. Always so much to do. You can never do it all. Here's a question I see a lot. Um, not just on my channel, but um, on other channels where there's building projects or, you know, off-grid living, all that kind of stuff, is how do I get my spouse to join me in this? This is my dream, but it's not the dream of my spouse. So you can make it as appealing or unappealing as you want. For an example is you can have a crappy little outhouse that is just two sticks and a hole in the ground. <laughs> I don't know why there's sticks. But, uh, you know, not much of a structure that smells and is disgusting. And I wouldn't want to live there either. I would be like, see you later. Give me a toilet. Um, but you can make it as comfortable or as uncomfortable as you want, you know. Make modifications. Like, you can have a beautiful outhouse. Look at mine. It is a, my, I put more effort into this new outhouse than I ever have before. And it is a beauty. I look forward to going into it every day. But I also have an indoor camping toilet that I use because I don't want to come out at night and in the summer sometimes there's bears around here I don't want to like walk into a bear while I'm going to the outhouse in the winter it's 40 below I don't want to go out to an outhouse all the time at 40 below in summer the mosquitoes are all over you and they'll just like make the experience miserable so you can either opt to get septic you know like make that and make that one of your plans is like go through a list with your spouse and just see what what it is they don't like. I mean, if they don't like the whole concept of it, like I don't want to live in the woods, I don't want to live far from people, I want to be in the middle of a city in an apartment, well, then you're kind of going to have trouble convincing them, I think. Even then, maybe you find a place that is close to people or close to a town or a city or a place they love with like, you know, close to their friends and or has lots of social things going on. I mean, is it the work that they don't want to have if you live off grid? Um, do they have no interest in, you know, building a place? Well, then you, you know, look at places that are already built and that you don't have to put a ton of time and effort into. And starting from scratch, they can have total say in, you know, what kind of place you build. And maybe that's where you compromise is giving them exactly what they want inside. It also can be a lot of work. So if your spouse isn't really into all of that extra work that it requires, like maybe they don't want to put all the work into gardening or homesteading and being completely self-sufficient. Maybe you get electrical to make things a little bit easier for them. There may just have to be some concessions you make for them because isn't that what a relationship is all about? Compromise? I don't know, I've been single a long time. So maybe a way to get your spouse who is really hesitant, even after all the great things that I've said about living this way, is to take them on a little trial run, you know? Maybe go rent a cabin for a couple weeks and uh, try different cabins. Try one that, you know, has no power, that's totally off grid, see how you both do with it. Um, maybe you'll find out that you hate it too. <laughs> a semi off grid place that has power but maybe has an outhouse and that they may be fine with that who knows or you may find that but it, or you may find that they want to have all the amenities that you know they have in the city 
and that's good like the, the fact that you find that out is really important before you move so where do you start i'll acknowledge right now that buying land and building a place post pandemic especially is not easy it was way cheaper for me when i did it you know 14 years ago um, prices of land and lumber have skyrocketed and we don't know when they're going to come down look at it realistically you're not going to get a place for free. You're not going to get land for free or cabin for free. You're going to have to invest somewhere, somehow, if you want a place to live. It's your investment for the future. So, yeah, it's not going to be free. You see a lot of people comment on the prices of, you know, building materials and, oh, well, land is that this much. Well, yeah, welcome to reality. You're going to have to pay for it. No one's going to give you a piece of land. You're not Dick Prenicky who can go up in the middle of Alaska and you know do it for nothing although Dick even had to pay for things you know not everything was free you think all those flights into his place were for free no it's not realistic but if it's going to be your place where you live full-time you know year-round then you gotta invest man proximity to services that is key I moved here because I wanted to be in a smaller place with less population less pollution less noise less people did I say less people less people <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was too many people down south, way too many people. That may not be for you, but that was one of the things that was on my list. Right now I'm about an hour from town, so that means, you know, groceries, liquor store, gas, it's all an hour away. Uh, can't just drop off, drop things and, you know, run to the store for some milk or whatever. I do need to plan ahead, but that is uh, not a big deal. And when I was commuting to work, it was a little bit more of an issue. Um, spent a lot more on gas before the uh, COVID hit. Now I'm working from home and my dogs are howling. Excuse the dog howling. Musical interlude. Yeah, so do you have kids? Do you have to look at how close schools are? Do you want them to be bussed into town to go to school? Um, how close do you want to be to, you know, like recreational activities? If your kids are in a sport or if you're, you're in sports? How far do you want to be from that? The thing is like a fire hall for us around here. We have a fire hall close by, but it doesn't really have any volunteers in it right now. The next closest one is almost to town. So it's about 50 minutes away. So that is something that plays into effect when you try and get insurance around here. If there's not a fire hall close by, it's a lot more difficult and more expensive to get insurance. I used to want to live in a place where I had no, no road access and where I had to hike in, you know, for 20 minutes to get to my cabin. Reality then set in and I realized that wasn't feasible at all for me because I was, most of us do have to work full time. So I was working in town and I didn't want to, you know, hike out to my car <laughs> 30 minutes away, try and get it started in the winter. So the age old question is on grid or off grid? Well, as I said earlier, I spent a few years off grid and I did not enjoy it at all. I was living pretty simply back then in a tiny little shack, not even a cabin, I don't really think. Um, it had four inch walls with very little insulation, was pretty cold in the winter, um, didn't have the greatest wood stove, had mice in the roof. <laughs> it was just all around bad. And I didn't, we didn't have internet back then. I sound ancient, but we did not have internet. There was no cell service out there. That was pretty, uh, a pretty isolated time. Um, I did, didn't mind that part of it. I was more adventurous back then and willing to deal with a lot more adversity than I am now. I like a pretty comfortable life right now. But 20 years ago, I was pretty I was willing to do anything and deal with anything. I was just happy to be in the Yukon in a cabin in the woods. Um, now I have standards. Yeah, I found that just learning the solar systems um, and batteries and all that just was not in my wheelhouse. I couldn't do it. I just had, I mean, I'm sure I could have learned it, but when I moved here, I knew I was going to be learning so much about building the cabin and spending so much time researching stuff, talking to people, you know, I just, my brain didn't have any more room for a solar system and how I'm going to keep power to my cabin. Um, I did not want to deal with like ever going without power and having, you know, to rely on myself to fix it because I knew that would go sideways fast. <laughs> you may have a lot more confidence in yourself, and um, more power to all the people who do it because a lot of people do it out there and they really know their systems and they make it happen in any environment. But uh, it just was a thing that wasn't for me. And you know, that's fine if it's not for you. You know, whatever 
it's not about pleasing other people. It's about what you're comfortable with and what you want to deal with in your life. Something that I didn't really think about was uh, my soil around here for when I moved in and uh, was possibly going to get septic in the future. So I, as I said, I've been using an outhouse, but I did have um, a company come out and do some percolation tests for a possible future septic system. And I realized that in behind my cabin, it's all very crappy drainage, clay, full of clay. In front of it is my big wide open meadow and it's sand and it drains beautifully. But I didn't know that really before I built my place. So it would have been better if I'd built further down, probably higher up, further down, and in the sandy area because a septic system would have been more doable. I can still do it. It has to be an on ground kind of system, um, but it also is gonna cost like $25,000. So right now my little outhouse is working for me. And I really, using an outhouse is not that big a deal. Like I said, you get used to it. Some people use a bucket and sawdust, and some people get composting toilets, but I've heard nothing but crappy things. <laughs> that was a good joke that he didn't mean to make. Nothing but crappy things about the, the composting toilets. I've heard that they can be just nightmares to deal with. I do remember one friend telling me years ago when I was first building my place that she has had a septic system or a composting toilet for years and she had an off-grid place and it was a big septic system because she raised her family there and it was in the basement and she said Stacy I've been up to my armpit in shit so many times that I don't it doesn't even phase me anymore trying to fix her, her composting toilet because it always got clogged and that was the moment I decided a composting toilet was not for me yeah water source that's really important um get a place on a lake if you can get a place by a creek you know, if you can i mean that's ideal if you aren't gonna have like the local water utility to rely on for me we have a water treatment plant close by and i just haul my water from that I just haul my water from there year round and it's super easy it takes me like an hour i do it every 10 days or so to fill up my 250 gallon tank inside and i haul with my truck uh, 125 gallon tank so then i pump it into my indoor tank and uh, but before that i hauled from creeks i hauled in like the really common for the cabin people is the blue gallon blue five gallon water jugs that you use for camping those like some you know i've had those like <laughs> piled up uh, on top of each other all over my cabin you know i've owned like more than i can count how many of those things that i've owned and um, those are the mainstays for people who don't have a way to haul water. They just haul it. But you know, that gets heavy <laughs> after years of hauling water. I mean, those jugs aren't light. Um, that's another thing you got to think of is, you know, are you going to age in this place? You know, 20 years, you guys may be young, but 20 years ago, <laughs> I feel like I'm really old. 20 years goes by really fast. And, you know, your physical capability changes, whether you like it or not, whether you stay in great shape or not. Like, you know, it changes as you get older. Things get a little bit harder. For me, I've just like not had as much desire to haul jugs and stuff as I used to. I, oops, I like the easier lifestyle. So I get a lot of questions on how people can find land here in the Yukon. And of course it's gonna be different for other places, you know, whether you're across Canada or in the States. <laughs> But here what I was able to do was apply for a spot land application, they call them. You can go to the government website and look at um, applying for undeveloped land, I think it's called. It has a process there on how to go about it. It's easy to find undeveloped land around here, anywhere close to either one of the communities or cities. To go out at least 45 minutes, maybe an hour from those places. But if you're willing to do that, then you have a lot better chance of finding some land. I wanted to be within certain areas of town and I also wanted to be fairly close to power because I knew I wanted power then so I wanted to be able to hook up to the grid fairly cheaply some places uh, you know you're too far away from the power grid and it costs hundreds of thousand dollars to hook up so which is why some people my neighbors that end up going solar I just poured over maps and talked to the lands branch on where I could apply and then just went to the areas that I preferred and looked around there so I just drive down the highway, get out of my car and go, okay, this is where I wanna, it would be a cool place to live. And then I'd go look around the properties or look around the landscape to see if there was any place that was worth building on. And then I came, I came bushwhacking through here. I 
and came across this and was like, oh my God, it was actually up there. It was where I found it. It was a smaller open meadow and that I was like, whoa, oh my God, I want to live here. And then I came over here and found this huge meadow and was like, the, yeah, this is a place I want. How you do it here. I mean, you can also go private sales, you know, you can look online, um, go to real estate agents, that kind of stuff. Um, go talk to the lands branch, you know, they're helpful there and, you know, uh, really can explain to you on what your options are. In other areas, I know there's like, you know, you can go land auctions, there's like Craigslist and stuff. We don't really use that here. Facebook groups can also be helpful. You know, we've got some really good uh, community groups here. And um, that'd be a great way to connect with people. Talking to locals, going to an area and talking to people is also a good way to do it. You may find that, you know, these people are a bunch of assholes in this in this town. I don't want to live here. Just go drive around. You know, some people just put up private signs and uh, property from the road system that you may not have been able to find online. Sometimes looking in classifieds like real papers, which some people still use. You know, there's some people out there who don't use social media, believe it or not, who don't advertise online or even with real estate companies. They'll just put it in the classified. So uh, definitely up here, you know, there's a segment of people who still rely on papers. Just basically got to hustle, you know, talk to locals, talk to people, get to know an area that you want to, that you're interested in and just go, like I said, hit the pavement. You got to put the work into it. You're going to hear this throughout this whole video that you have to put the work into it. You can't just lay around from your couch and expect to find the perfect property. It's just not going to happen. Looking at zoning and regulations, that's really important as well because the regulations may dictate, you know, well, they do often dictate what kind of place you can build and that may go against the kind of place that you actually want to build. So just where you're building your cabin, is it going to be a suitable building place? Or is it going to cost you a ton of money to uh, get the ground prepared? Also for building a driveway to get into your place. Are you going to have to spend tons of money on that? Like that will make it not really worth your while to build in that specific spot. Oh, so here I had permafrost down my driveway. So I had to, and I didn't know that until I bought the place and the lands person pointed it out and insisted that I build a corded driveway. So cutting the logs and putting them sideways, but it was only for a small section of it, maybe 50 feet or something. And that was a ton of work. If I had to do that for my whole driveway, it would have taken me the whole summer to do that because it was, you know, just cutting trees and throwing them on the ground to cover up that permafrost. And then the road was built over top of that. Good, reliable access to your cabin is super important. It was to me because like I said, I worked in town, so I needed to get in and out pretty easily. I have neighbors who haven't made real driveways and every spring they have to park at the end of their driveway and walk in because it's so muddy. The spring melt can take, you know, three weeks. And they're, at that point, their driveway is just so muddy that they can't get down it. I, and my driveway is long. It's a half a kilometer long. So if you watch any of my winter videos, all you did was see me plowing snow last winter. <laughs> and it was a ton of time and effort and major frustration last year to keep it clear. If I did that dream, like living, you know, 30 minutes off of a, a road system, uh, you have to hike in, you have to bring a hike in, ATV and snowmobile and whatever, all of your supplies. So if you're building, you know, that's a crap ton of supplies you need to bring in. At any rate, it's just a lot more work and you may be totally fine with that. Like look at our good friend Russell at Raspberry Rock. He lives way off the road system, has to haul everything with his quad and uh, seems happy doing it. You know, he makes some good videos about getting stuck too, which is always entertaining. But if you're living there in a place like that and you're working full time, and you want to get home quickly at the end of the day, do you really want to be bouncing along on a quad with your groceries? Um, you may be fine with that. And then if you're in an area where it's really cold and like, what if your quad doesn't start at the end of the day, you know? Do you leave it out for the whole day in that spot? Um, is it safe to do so? Will someone come along and steal it? Um, there's lots of things to think through. Well, with building a cabin, if you like tools, you'll end up with a lot of tools. <laughs> that was my most recent purchase, which is awesome, by the way. And I think everybody I know who lives in a cabin, who has lived in cabins for years, decades even, I don't know of one person who's actually finished it. <laughs> so if you're somebody who really wants to finish projects and it bothers you if a project is not finished, like your home being finished, um, probably don't buy, or probably don't build a cabin from scratch because there's a little thing I like to call building burnout. You'll be working on your cabin so much for so long, all day, every day. You know, if you have a full-time job, you'll be doing, that's all you'll be doing outside of your full-time job is working on your home. 
and I found after about four, five, six years maybe, I can't even remember now, I hit a wall. I did so much, I just got building burnout. I was done. I just like was, I can't do any more. My place was comfortable to live in. Um, things weren't finished, but I just couldn't do any more. I didn't want to put another nail in. I didn't want to do anything. It was just done. And it took me a few years to get over that. I remember my breaking point was on my ceiling. <laughs> I was putting my ceiling uh, boards up by myself, laying on scaffolding with one arm holding one end, one leg holding the other end, nail gunning them in. And I just thought, this is the worst freaking job in the world. I was doing it alone and I really should have had help. I should have asked for help <laughs> for that part of it. There's just some things that you need help with. Um, Eventually my parents, I think they came up the next summer and helped me do the other half of the cabin roof, the ceiling inside. And that went way faster, it was much more enjoyable. Uh, there's another thing, if you're doing it alone, you are totally gonna hit the bur building burnout stage for sure. I don't know why when I did my electrical, I actually took an electrical course. It was like a weekend course that I took at the local college. If you do your own, the course and pass it, you get to do your own residential wiring. Um, so I took that and then I realized how much work it was gonna be to wire my cabin and and I realized I just didn't want to do it. I was really glad to have that knowledge about wiring because it was a lot less intimidating. Now if something goes wrong or sideways with wiring, I can fix it, troubleshoot it, or know where to go for help. But um, I just didn't want to wire my whole cabin. So I called an electrician one weekend. He came out, I went to a music festival, came back and was magically, my cabin was wired. It was probably the best, you know, a few thousand dollars I ever spent. <laughs> that said, building your own place, the things you learn, I said that earlier, but it's worth repeating that the things you learn are gonna come in handy down the road for sure. It's not a bad thing to keep learning things and I'm still learning things as I'm going. I had never used a miter saw before uh, this summer and I just bought that to do the trim work. I have uh, trouble figuring out angles still. We have a complicated relationship, Angles and I, but uh, I'm confident that we'll get it figured out in the future. And I like to say that true self-reliance comes when you have to figure out shit for yourself. <laughs> you will become a jack of all trades. You'll learn how to be independent. You'll learn how to fix things yourself and deal with things that you never thought you could before. Uh, but now you have to because you have no choice. Another benefit of outhouses Outhouse art. <laughs> Don't cows and outhouses just go hand in hand? So I'm going to go over some of the pros and cons of cabin life. You may know about all of these already, but uh, this is for the uninitiated or, you know, for those of you trying to convince your partner to join in on this lovely lifestyle. Less people. Less people. As I said earlier, less people. <laughs> Being rural is the best. Being alone in the woods is the best and not having neighbors close by is also very awesome. Places in town here are so expensive that it's cheaper to live this way. There's less taxes out here in the woods. Seriously, like my taxes are like a couple hundred dollars a year. Freedom. There's just a sense of freedom being out here that I don't feel when I'm anywhere else. Basically, it's like camping every day. And who doesn't like camping? People love camping. Most people love camping. So the wildlife is amazing. It's one of the best reasons being here. One morning I woke up and there was a herd of 50 elk bedded down in my yard. Um, I've seen bears come through here. I've had porcupines. I've had lynx. I've had a bison wander through here. It's just, there's birds everywhere. Um, the gophers, ground squirrels are not my favorites, but they are around here too. So it is just a little wildlife haven and I love it. I love just watching, you know, the birds fly around. I have a bat. I have a bat back. My bat's been with me for two years now. We have a two year summer relationship, me and this bat. It's entertaining. It's entertaining just watching the bat fly around or, you know, watching the wildlife go by going out on the trails. I love going out on the trails. It's where I get my energy from is going out there and just seeing what's new on the trail that day, you know, like, oh, there's new ducks in the pond. Oh, wow. Oh, there's new tracks in the snow. What's that? You know, it's just the best. Being a minimalist. Sometimes that is a good thing. Not having too much crap, too, having a lot of crap and clutter around is stressful to me. And I don't have the choice to have a lot of crap lying around. I still do sometimes, but I really try and keep it to a minimum. Oh, it looks like it wants to go live in a cabin. It's very interesting. 
Oh, and the community. That's the best part about all of this is the community, homesteading, cabin life, off-grid living, not just on YouTube, but all over the place. You know, there's lots of discussion forums and um, you kind of become part of this little community of like-minded people and it's fantastic. It's one of the best parts of living this way. Cons. Okay, I'm not going to say it's all great living in a cabin. Um, some of the cons for sure are, for me, things that freeze. When I'm hauling water at minus 30, um, you know, I have to drive really fast from the water treatment plant to my place, which is about a six minute drive, <laughs> not even. And uh, by the time I get here, my water tank will start freezing and I need to pump it into the cabin as fast as I can. So that's kind of a downside. Plowing my driveway, all the maintenance that is involved is sometimes a bit of a downside. When it becomes a lot, you know, a lot more work than you want that year. And it all depends on mother nature. You never know what each year is going to be like. Commute is a bit of a bummer when I need, um, when I forget like a part for plumbing or something, just a tiny little part that I don't have that I forgot at the liquor store. <laughs> the liquor store. <laughs> Being an hour from liquor is also a con. <laughs> but no, you really have to plan ahead when you go shopping and get, oh my dogs are, hey there! Hey! I'm almost done. It's harder to get experts to come out. You know, if I, my issue with the water pump to get somebody to come out here would have cost a fair bit. You know, you have to charge them. Or they charge you for the commuting time. So that's an added cost. That's why you end up doing stuff yourself. One thing I found is 20 years into this, the older I get, the less energy I have to deal with things. So that's about it for me. I hope you found this helpful. And I really wanted just to inspire people. Uh, this is not an exhaustive uh, list on how to build a cabin or a step-by-step -step process on anything. It is more just of a moral encouragement, um, uh, kick in the pants, and uh, you know, an encouragement for you to go out there and do it. Anybody can do this. You're going to get frustrated along the way, and maybe even just starting and looking into the process is annoying and complicated to you. But um, believe me, you're going to run into that no matter whether you buy a house, you deal with all the legal stuff, you know, or get a cabin. You're going to have to deal with some of that stuff you don't want to deal with. And that's just part of life. Dealing with the crap we hate is part of it. Dealing with the regulations and the zoning and permits and all that was like the worst part of it for me. I hated every minute of it other than the ceiling part. But uh, <laughs> that's just a part you have to deal with. The thing about it is, is that part ends. You know, you move past it. Once you deal with it, it may be a nightmare for a few months, a year, who knows how long. Um, as long as you're not in a race to the finish line, which you can't be because this is a long process. You got to just roll with the punches and go and do it. Why aren't you doing it? Go, go look for land. Go buy a cabin. Go do it. Go build a cabin. Go buy some tools. Start researching. Go look on YouTube on how to build a cabin. Start looking at framing. Start researching how to use tools. Start researching what tools you need to use. Like some of these tools I didn't even know existed before I went, I came here. It's all worth it in the end. So go out. Go on. Go. Make it happen. See you later.